I'm Ben Absher, working on continuous gravitational wave uh, and uh, trying to use deep learning to improve searches on uh, continuous gravitational wave. So um, I just want to mention at first that I'm not, uh, this is a work in progress, so I'm not going to show you any results about the performance of the network. And uh, I'm just going to tell you about the, uh, the data that we are using, the general idea, the result that we are, uh, want to have from the network, and the challenges and ideas. And we would be happy to hear about uh, your experiences and any ideas that you have about that. So continuous gravitational wave is a type of gravitational wave that is emitting from the source continuously, and that's why it's called continuous gravitational wave. And uh, the source can be, for example, a neutron stars that are orbiting around its axis but have some irregularities on surface, for example, mountains that can generate this, uh, conti this continuous gravitational wave. These waves actually are about uh, five orders of magnitude weaker than the ones that has been observed before for binary mergers. And that's why we haven't yet seen uh, or observed this gravitational wave. We would need uh, more sensitive detectors and also uh, more powerful data analysis methods to observe those. So uh, gravitational wave uh, can be defined with uh, its uh, frequency, frequency derivatives, and also the sky location with alpha and delta. And uh, so if we have some observational data, we will, using some searching method like match filtering to search over uh, the possible signals that might be in the data, and then the result would be the uh, likelihood of having that part of that kind of a signal in the data. The search that I'm working on is an all-sky search, so we are looking at the on the whole sky instead of just targeting what. Uh, specific target on the sky and looking at that. So it makes the computations more complex. And we are using um, Einstein at home, which is a um, big cluster uh, with a high uh, computational power that we will use for these searches. The data that I'm showing you here is from LIGO 01 All Sky Search for 20 to 100 hertz. And uh, instead of looking at the, on the whole uh, frequency range, uh, we are uh, having 50 millihertz, we are dividing the whole uh, frequency range to 50 millihertz band and looking at each of these 50 millihertz band of data to search for a gravitational wave. So um, what would be the output of the Einstein at home searches? So the output is basically for each of the grid points uh, in, the pa in the parameter space that we have, which is frequency, frequency derivative, and the two sky location, is uh, basically a score which says the likelihood of having a gravitational wave at that, um, at that point. And we call it detection statistic. So here is an image which is shown only the, to the two dimension on the data, uh, f and f dot. And so this uh, direction is the showing actually the value of the detection statistic. And so this is one of the outputs from the uh, Einstein at home. So if we have a, s a gravitational wave signal or a noise, what happens is that we will see elevated values of detection statistic, and there might be over densities around. There are over densities of these elevated value close to the place which this signal or noise is happening. So we will have something like this, which is showing that there were white noise in here, which these values are elevated and we'll see these over densities. So this brings us to an idea which is uh, important in, um, in uh, searching for continuous gravitational wave, which is called clustering, which instead of going through this whole 50 millihertz band of data and searching for a continuous gravitational wave, we only go through the, these over dense areas, which uh, we call them clusters, and bundle all these elevated values which are close together and believe that they are from the same root cause. So if we want to search over a, uh, for a uh, gravitational wave signal, we only search over in these areas that we are called these are clusters. So uh, the point is that there is no mathematical method to find this or a defined method that we can find this cluster in, a, in each of our data set because um, these clusters can have different morphologies 
for different searches, if you have different uh, time of the observation, different, sort, different type of the signal, can generate different type of these clusters. So we are hoping with deep learning, trying to generalize and find these clusters in, the, in, in our uh, data. Uh, so definitely for a deep learning, we need a training set, so we have to work on our training set. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, so what we are doing is basically trying to assign our uh, data set into an image. And uh, this is something that I was talking actually yesterday with Kai, and he was mentioning maybe this is not the best approach, but this is the approach that we came up with, but we are open to hear your ideas if you have any uh, better uh, experiences with that. So uh, this is, so as I said, we are uh, assigning our uh, data into an image since we have a four dimensional data because of the frequency, frequency derivative and the sky locations. And uh, the four dimensional uh, imaging network is not as, uh, right now is not as powerful as the uh, two dimensional one. So we are trying to, we are basically dividing our data set into two sets of two dimensional data. Uh, so we have uh, here I'm showing its frequency derivative and, uh, and frequency and the other two dimensions are basically projected into that plane. And uh, so this is uh, all the pixels in frequency, all the pixels in frequency dot and the value of each pixel basically is the uh, detection statistic. And so uh, I'm showing here these uh, markers basically showing you the uh, center of the signal. And so you can see that there is uh, these uh, clusters around this signal. You can realize it. So what we want from the network is, OK, this is my first cluster with all these uh, pixels related to that. This is my second cluster with all the pixels, and so on. Uh, we found that uh, probably uh, using uh, instant segmentation method would be a good approach to solve this problem. Um, so the, one of the challenges is that we are actually having, uh, so each of our data set basically has a lot of data, a lot of pixels around for a typical search would be around like 10 to the 9 uh, data points uh, the, uh, or pixels in this image, which is too huge to give it to the network. And also sometimes our, our data is too sparse and maybe hard for a network to realize it. So we are going to uh, reconstruct this image to a lower resolution image by dividing the, whole, the original image into uh, a 40 times 40 pixel uh, tiles and then using these tiles as a pixel uh, for the lower resolution image and then using the density of this um, uh, detection statistic value in these tiles as a value for the pixel for the lower resolution image. And then we will have an image like this which um, basically reduced the dimensionality uh, by three to four orders of magnitude. But still, uh, this image is too large to give it to a network. We still have to tile it up into uh, sizes usually around 20 times 20, 200 uh, times 200 pixels that a network can handle it with the current GPUs that we have available. And, uh, but you might think that, okay, if we divide it into small tiles, the clusters might be chopped up and it would be hard for the network to realize it. But apparently, um, instant segmentation network are approved to be very powerful on that, to be able, even by giving, you, giving a chop of the cluster, it can be able to realize the whole uh, shape of the cluster by just putting all those chopped together. Um, so, but... So now that we have our training uh, set, we need to label them for sure. So uh, to label them, we found uh, the label maker um, software, which are outside, uh, not easy to use since you have to use a mouse and go uh, just uh, click, click, click all to find this uh, the outline of your cluster, which uh, is not easy. Uh, so we thought that maybe using an iPad with an eye pencil, you can actually go easily through your uh, cluster and find these outlines and uh, create your mask. But then we're only using a graphical software. So uh, what I have is at, at the end having all the shapes for this uh, cluster with different colors and then using this with an, another code to change it to the uh, mask, which would be readable for a network and then using it at that. I don't know if anyone has any 
um, experience in this case, if you have like a better idea on that, which we can use and would be easy, I would be happy to hear. Uh, and uh, finally, I want to tell you about some uh, important strategies that we have to uh, decide on when we wanted to train the network. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is, so we can basically divide the clusters that we have into two general classes. One are the clusters which are large, and it's easy to observe, like this cluster that you can see here. You can easily observe, uh, see it with your eye. But there are clusters which are actually very small, and you might not even see with the eye that there is an uh, elevated value of the detection statistic and a small overdensities around it. Um, so. If there is going to be a, a continuous gravitational wave signal in the data, it most probably be something like these small ones, not these large ones. So the question here is that do we need to uh, basically divide and have two different networks, one working on the larger ones and one working on the smaller ones, or the network is intelligent enough to uh, basically work on the both, combine those things at the same time and then realize them? Another thing uh, that we are not sure is that, so uh, on the different frequency ranges, basically you have uh, different morphology of the input data. So here is at lower frequency, 20, about 20 hertz, uh, you will see very white spaces in the middle, which basically white pixels, which basically means that these pixels doesn't have any value, we don't have a data for it. But when you go to the higher um, frequencies, you will see that uh, this is, we will, you're not seeing those white spaces, so it's more dense data, so you have basically data for all the points. We're not sure if uh, the, the, the network would be able to uh, re like handle these uh, differences in, of the input data, or we have to train on a separate network for each. And uh, also the approach that I used for um, the four-dimensional data that we have, trying to uh, reduce it in the size to two-dimensional data. This is, these are some things that we wanted to um, basically more uh, having a better ideas or uh, decide on that. And with that, I just put my conclusion on and take any questions if you have. Radius. Right, yes.